few days into the year 2023, there was a dramatic shootout in northwest Mexico that killed 29 people, injured many more, and damaged three aeroplanes. This eruption of violence was a result of state security forces arresting Ovidio Guzman, the son of notorious drug lord Joaquim El Chapo Guzman. Scenes like these, as well as grisly images of drug-related killings, have unfortunately become synonymous with Mexico. There are countless documentaries and prominent Netflix dramatizations based around the war on drugs and the Mexican drug cartels. Alongside this, Gennaro Garcia Luna, the former security minister under former president Felipe Calderón, the man who was tasked with fighting the cartels, was just convicted in the US of drug trafficking and accepting millions of dollars in bribes from the Sinaloa cartel. And then, of course, year after year, Mexico is designated one of the most dangerous places for journalists to work. None of this helps the international image of Mexico. But that is only part of the picture, said Siria Gastelum Felix, a former award-winning journalist, a native of Sinaloa, and director of resilience at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. So for this episode, we're not going to be focusing on organized crime in Mexico. Instead, we're going to talk about resilience, those who stand up to and against organized crime. Welcome to The Index from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm your host, Dan Lai Nguyen. In this series, we delve into the Organized Crime Index, a free resource that measures organized crime and resilience in over 190 countries around the world. Now, Mexico's resilience score is lower than the global average, but there is a vibrant community of activists, journalists, and non-governmental organizations that are committed to exposing the truth, despite a hostile environment and at a risk to their lives. There is also an innovative project called the Resilience Fund, whose origins can be traced back to Mexico. The fund identifies civil society actors that do important work in their communities and helps them with building the capacity and financial support. And it was Syria, our guest for this episode, who first established the predecessor to the Resilience Fund in Sinaloa in 2017. But first, I asked her to tackle this image people have of Mexico, and whether that's a Hollywood caricature or rooted in reality. I really appreciate the question because, you know, this is actually a question that relates with the origin of the Resilience Project. And I would say that, yes, of course, some of those depictions in fiction are reflecting the reality, right? Like at the end of the day, it's not just media fabricating stuff. The reality feeds into media. And in fact, some of the horrific stories of violence, I mean, are, are even more incredible than what we can see on Netflix. However, my point with that is that what media presents us is a very limited vision of organized crime, a vision that has actually complicated the understanding of the complexity that organized crime in Mexico is. Media likes the story of like good versus bad, good versus evil, police against the narcos. And really, like when we are talking about Mexico, it's not as easy, you know, like these big cartels that are one solid, monolithic, powerful entity. They don't exist like that anymore. And, you know, this vision of Mexico as a lawlessness place Yes, perhaps in some places, but that's not that's not the case. Mexico, uh, at the end of the day, is still a functioning democracy. It has big economic power. There's so many other factors that show, you know, a vibrant, peaceful communities all over the country. However, the story of organized crime is undeniably violent, undeniably hard. It's, it's a reality that is present in people's lives. It has, but it's also not new, right? So there's always been, in Mexico being next to the United States, right? Like there's always been that level of illicit markets, illicit flows, whether it was alcohol in the times of prohibition, whether it's marijuana, when marijuana was the biggest market there, or whether it's synthetic drugs now, the fact that Mexico is in, in you know, in the border with the biggest drug market adds to this to this story. But the reason why I said that 
you know, this this question relates to the origin of, of the Resilience Fund, which was actually before called the Resilience Project, is that myself, being from the state of Sinaloa, a, a state that has been become incredibly popular in the world because of violence and organized crime, it always felt that that was not the complete story of Sinaloa, that even when we were talking about organized crime, there was a counterbalance to this violence and this ugliness, which for me was the brave, courageous civil society that is not just, you know, sitting around waiting for the violence to happen to them, but who are actually active players, active partners with uh, even law enforcement, local governance, in, in changing this violent reality in Mexico. So I guess that was the, the beginning of the intention of the Resilience Project to balance the story of organized crime. And, you know, it's, it's also the, the story of, of how we look at the criminality scores with the index, right, to also counterbalance with resilience. Mm, that's really interesting. And, and, and I want to talk more about the Resilience Fund later as well and, and Sinaloa in, in itself. And, you know, it's fascinating to hear because, you know, I come from Burma and it's another one of those countries where both the media portrayal and international understanding seem to be very black and white, right? There's only seen two sides of the coin when there are so many different sides and angles to that particular story. So I want to hear more about it. But let's talk in general around uh, resilience first before we go specifically to the resilience fund. Mexico score quite low in the index when it comes to resilience, to organized crime. Where do you think are the weakest links? Why is the score low? Well, I mean, the score breaks down the factors, right? We can see like a very low score in territorial integrity, for example, and that speaks to us on the border issues of Mexico. And like I say, just it's, it's just because, you know, that border with the United States is so huge and and, and you can only imagine what entails to be next to the biggest market and the biggest producer also, for example, arms, when it comes to arms trafficking. So there is the issue, for example, that rank really low in the, in the index, which is political leadership and governance. Although Mexico is a democracy, this is a quite recent democracy and quite uh, a democracy that definitely, as we have seen in, in each election, electoral process, it still has a long way to go and a lot of a long way to go to, to become a, a strong representational democracy because it is also permeated by organized crime, you know, the, the political climate as well. But for me, all these things come down to corruption the very high levels of corruption, this institutionalized corruption that is not just a matter of government, but it's also a matter of state that it doesn't only, you know, work at the national level, but we really have to see these local political dynamics and, you know, in rural places, for example, how these things combine with the criminal flows. Corruption has a lot to do with this low score on resilience because no matter how organized civil society can be, how much civil society has been growing and, and becoming more professionalized in the last years, unfortunately, the country has not been able to deal in an effective manner with the issue of corruption. I mean, the fact that more than 90% of crimes of assassinations just go, disappearances go unpunished, this tells you of how we can we can really see the challenges for resilience. Another very important factor, for example, in the resilience score, we see victim and witness support at 3.5, you know, in a country with 100,000 people who are reported as missing with the high levels of feminicide. I mean, the fact that we have such an overwhelming witness in dealing with victims, it, it tells you, you know, this is a sign of... of how this is going to impact society and its power to organize in the future. Now, Syria, you've been a journalist as well, and you've also been working on these issues, resilience and organized crime for quite a while. Tell us how challenging is it to be a journalist or a community, you know, a, a civil service organization or a community activist fighting organized crime in this kind of atmosphere, right? Because We've also seen from the index that there's collusions between mafia groups and state embedded actors. So how how difficult and how challenging is it to fight against those things? 
Yes, I, I am really proud to say that I was a journalist in my previous life. It is a fascinating story full of very rich cultures that it, it is really amazing to cover. However, also when I was covering, it didn't used to be this dangerous. Mexico has changed a lot since 2008, 2010, when the so-called war on drugs was declared. There's From this period onwards, there's an increase in, mili in militarized responses to organized crime, for example, that have had an impact in the increase of violence in general in the country. So even the political, democratical transition, recently Mexico for like 80 years had one single political party. So in 2000, when this scheme is no longer valid and there's more political actors, these fragmentations also cause fragmentations of power in Mexico, which made it extremely difficult for local journalists to cover organized crime because, of course, at the local level, there is less protections than, for example, let's say, journalists who are covering national news in Mexico City. So a lot of factors have contributed to the to increasing risk for, for journalists in Mexico. As you know, Mexico is right now, if not the most violent, the most violent country for journalists. As a famous journalist in Mexico, Marcela Turati once said, in Mexico, it's more dangerous to investigate a crime than to commit it because these journalists, I mean, and the assassinations of journalists have also like increased dramatically in the last years. No, it's not only the assassinations, it's also journalists have, who have been disappeared, journalists who are getting tortured more often. But there's also all these ways that journalists are, are increasingly being harassed either smear campaigns on social media, legal lawsuits. The climate in Mexico is really, is really, really difficult for journalists. And, and they think, like, again, right, like the story is not so easy. It's not just like organized crime killing journalists and it's just like bad people who are going after the journalists. The thing is that it is also authorities. Like, it is this mix of political corruption, organized crime is all one Thing in the mix that is making this climate incredibly challenging for journalists and the impunity. Then again, I mean, anybody, it is very easy to murder a journalist and very likely that this will go unpunished, which is, you know, a great incentive for criminals. Yeah. And that quote, you know, that you cited is, it's, it's, very powerful, but also very sobering. And I think it uh, sums up the situation very, very clearly. Now, having said all of that, right, you, you've, you've explained in quite detail the challenges, quite, quite terrifying challenges that, you know, journalists face, civil society organizations face. And yet, you know, if we look again at the resilience score in the index, non-state actors in Mexico, you know, they, they fare higher than many other institutionally based indicators like the political leadership that you also mentioned earlier. And I think that also shows this incredible role that journalists and, you know, CSOs and, and, and essentially these watchdogs have been playing in the face of the very, very difficult climate. And I'm trying to understand where the commitment and the bravery and the courage and the inspiration comes from. Perhaps you can explain, yeah, you can explain how despite all these challenges, you know, people are continuing to fight. Yes, and it is interesting the way you put it, because in fact, we have seen this, and, and you know, although we're talking about the case of Mexico in particular, but throughout our work in the Resilience Fund, when we're documenting responses to organized crime in places where there's high indications of criminal governance, very bad corruption, how there's, you know, often there's these groups of women, networks of journalists, artists coming together, working, doing something for the youth. We see this over and over. And I think as I, as I have met more and more of these brave people who are doing this work in, you know, sacrificing their lives, doing it under really extreme circumstances, I think what I often find their motivation, it comes from a from a place of like, really, there's no other choice. I mean, we're talking most of these times it's in, in the the resilience score in Mexico is an indicator of that. I see, you know, when when everything else fails, society has to come and, and pick up the slack. And the, a really good example of that, and you're probably going to in your story, is the case of this massive problem of disappearances in Mexico, which it goes back to the beginning of the of the work of the Resilience Fund or, or the Resilience Work in the GI. 
this example of how, you know, there was a problem in many communities. It kept happening. Authorities were just doing nothing. And it was thanks to civil society working together, thanks to journalists reporting on it, thanks to artists helping these groups to make it more visible. It was really an example on how out of desperation, out of like doing nothing. I mean, when you lose your family, when you lose your home, I think people just find that in themselves, their resilience, that it's what helps them keep going. This is a good point to mention that the new iteration of the Global Organized Crime Index will be released later this year. And as part of that, new indicators have been studied and added. One of those is extortion. Now, extortion is a major issue in Mexico, and the Resilience Fund has also been helping activists fighting the scourge, including Vania Paginot, the co-founder of Amapola Periodismo, an organization that works to prevent extortion and also offers support to victims. También que con las víctimas mi trabajo ha tenido que ver con mucha incidencia en cómo... With the victims, my work has had to do with a lot of incidents on how they could not only protect themselves from crime, but to know a little more about the ways and the different modalities of extortions in the different cities like Acapulco in the Costa Grande. Uh, also, that the families do not have effective channels of denunciation and that they jointly seek these channels. Um, this is a type of work I have done as a journalist, but also trying to advocate beyond journalism with the families, who, besides being victims of extortion, are also victims of forced disappearance. The Resilience Fund, in the development of my work against extortion, uh, has supported on identifying the strengths of the people collectively, because it is families who are looking for missing persons, because it is families who demand justice for femicide or for cases of different types of violence. And extortion is a common denominator here. So identifying this part and demanding the authorities to investigate extortion before the crime they are demanding justice from has been an important work, um, as well as generating common points on how they can access a stronger complaints mechanism and how they can get the authorities to solve their cases. Pueden lograr que las autoridades resuelvan sus casos ha sido también muy importante. Now tell me a bit more about the Resilience Fund. Tell me where it started, how it started, and why it started. Uh, before the Resilience Fund, we launched what it was called the Resilience Project in Mexico. And this is at the beginning of the GI. Since the organization started, you know, we focus on organized crime, but we always had very clear that the story of organized crime is not just about the criminals, it's not just about the crime, that is a bigger story than that. So looking at resilience, we were trying to complete the pieces of the story to see where was civil society in the, in the equation. And what we started doing around 2014, 2015, I was living um, in Mexico at the time. So we started documenting community responses in Sinaloa. The premise was, like I was telling you, it was just to really understand what was the role of civil society in, in this equation and to assume that, you know, it, it was not just civil society passively waiting for these terrible things to happen, but that actually society had a role in these in this dynamics of violence, in these dynamics of victimization and, and community resilience. So we started documenting community responses to organized crime in Sinaloa. And also in this, in this, we published some case studies, but beyond those case studies, we had more. And then when you start looking at who are these actors and what are they doing and start also revising the literature, you start seeing some things appear. So what we started to seeing appear was like, oh, you know, there are there's groups of women that are organizing in different ways. There was, of course, the Mothers of Missing People, but there was also like, you know, these young women who were organizing to protect other young women in finding like bicycle, biking kind of groups to, to make women feel safer at night. Anyway, th there was groups of artists also working in their community. So we started seeing that, you know, groups of women, the artists working with youth, the journalists really had a role in, in these active civil society responses. So after we just did the cases, the documentation, we said, okay, what happens if we put all these, all these people together? Because, you know, sometimes they don't even know each other. They're working on similar things. So let's bring them all together. And we launched what we call the Resilience Dialogues. So from this exchange, it was really interesting too, because we were having a conversation with these actors about resilience, right? Like perhaps they were not framing their responses or their work 
in the way that we saw it in resilience. But after we open these conversations, we notice how this approach took us to building things together, to launching projects, community resilience projects that had endorsement by these groups, but also that had the push for 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 collective action. And, and that's what pushed us to like start incubating projects with these civil society actors. And, and that was the precursor of, of the Resilience Fund. After we finished this pilot project in Mexico, we replicated it in uh, Guatemala, in South Africa, in the Philippines. And based on the case studies, on the dialogues we did, and the projects we started incubating on these places is how the, the Resilience Fund was conceived. And now the Resilience Fund, it is a grant-making mechanism, meaning that we give funds to civil society organizations, individuals working on community resilience. But I want to think that it's not just about the funds to do resilience projects, but it's also about the resilience of the individuals and the organizations that receive the funds, because we also work with them through the period when they execute the grant to increase their administrative capacity, their capacity for advocacy. We give them support in security trainings in cyber digital security, but also actual protection when there are attacks because of their work. So yes, that is that is why what the Resilience Fund is now. But it started as a little project in Mexico. And like I said, basically, I mean, even before that, like it just starts with the intention of really bringing that that full picture of, of what a very complex criminality scenario looks like. And like I said, it's not just about Mexico. It is about everything, right? Like media or, or even academia, like we want to explain everything in a way that is simpler to understand. But when we look at organized crime, that's simply impossible in the Resilience Fund is trying to also bring that multiplicity of actors into the solutions, right? Like it's not just about, you know, international cooperation, helping states to beef up their police or to beef up their armies. It is what are other solutions that, sure, law enforcement is important, governance is important, and international cooperation, but let's include civil society, let's include journalists, activists in the conversations we want to have about changing things. Mm. And in a way, it's also to show that they have agency, right? That 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 it's not just about waiting for the state to move, but that there is also agency in local civil society groups. And I guess perhaps inspire ordinary people as well, that there are things that can be done to change the situation. Absolutely. And that factor of inspiration that you have mentioned, it is actually quite a thing that we see over and over with these community resilience initiatives or projects. Again, the, the cases of the mothers of the disappear has been one. The fact that, you know, they organize in one state, they inspire other people to do the same. They share their, their knowledge with the new groups and that's how something keeps going. And it is really inspiring. But like you say, there's also the, the issue of agency. It is also recognizing the knowledge they have, the experience they have. I mean, if we really want to understand what is happening with organized crime, we have to talk to the journalists. We have to talk to jo local journalists. We have to understand their threats. We have to be able to do better to protect them. Otherwise, there will be nobody left to investigate. There would be nobody left to tell the story that we're trying to, to get right to fix, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you talked about the fact that the fund started as a project in Sinaloa. For people who do not know where that is, what that is, why it plays an important role in both the criminal activities as, as well as resilience in Mexico, tell us a bit more about it. Well, Sinaloa became really famous in the last years in the organized crime world because of the cartel de Sinaloa and the very mediatic, flashy escapes of El Chapo and the story of El Chapo. And of course, it's all over entertainment, Hollywood style depictions of what this place looks like. When really the story of organized crime in Sinaloa has been there since the beginning of Times and Traders. And it is interesting because it is a place that is on the Pacific coast and close to the United States border. So these two things make it a place that has always been a key point of trafficking. We can even say that from the beginning, since the trafficking of opium used to come to the coast of Sinaloa from Asia and then be transported from these ports to the United States. So there's, there is a history of illicit trafficking that it's present in the state. 
Then again, of course, with the cocaine and the cartels, it became a transit point for for cocaine. Then also growing of uh, heroin, um, I mean, amapola and, and marijuana. But now these criminal organizations have also shifted, right? They have become more agile. They are also more fragmented, but also more capable of getting into other illicit markets like trafficking um, natural species, timber or, or totoaba, for example. But also producing a, a lot more of synthetic drugs, increasing also getting into things like human smuggling or human trafficking. Even before, the, the thing that I think captures the imagination and makes Sinaloa like this interesting place, of course, there is like also the history of narco royalties from Sinaloa, like, you know, it's not just El Chapo, it's the Arellano Felix. It's, there's a whole, like, the, the cradle of, of this 80s cocaine trafficking. It sort of comes, comes from there. But like I said before that, the patron saint of, of drug dealers, for example, there's Jesus Malverde, which is really a figure that's more like around the revolution time. It's like 1910s, 1920s. And he sort of became like a folk hero because supposedly the legend says he used to rob from the rich and give it to the poor. So they sort of like Robin Hood characters that then drug dealers, you know, sort of became a, a popular saint with its own chapel, with its own following. But what I'm saying about this story is that, you know, there's always been this mythology of like taking from the rich and giving to the poor, which sort of became like that legend of the narcos, you know, being like powerful, but good to the people and against the corrupt government. That's what there is a culture that is apologetic of drug trafficking. There is definitely a narco culture. And, you know, this is not from El Chapo and this is not new. It's always been there. It's a place that has a big, for example, musical industry. And a lot of this musical industry has to do with the support of the drug trade. Because there is a culture that has to do with the songs that are made about specific narcos. And, you know, this also keeps a lot of bands alive. So there's like a gender of music that, you know, has been allowed to exist because of these. There is things that have to do with music, fashion, aesthetics that have to do with crime. Like I said, it's, it's not just because of El Cartel de Sinaloa or El Chapo, but there are like some historical roots of this lawlessness and, and folk heroes that are anti-government. It is a fascinating place, but like, I'm, like I said, that's not just because of crime. At the same time, it's a place that is uh, next to the Sea of Cortez, so it's very rich in flora and fauna. Economic production in Aloha is not this uh, you know, lawlessness state that is, it is actually a quite rich and prosperous state. And I think in these places where violence is so pervasive, it also gives room to very beautiful expressions of art and peace because at the same time it has a thriving culture that has to do nothing with drugs and violence, but it's actually, you know, about all these other things that are quite rich and stories that are less told. No, that's fascinating. I mean, I feel like I'm getting a crash course, you know, in organized crime, but also history and the myths and the narratives around it and why the situation is is like this now. But tell us, Siri, about also how you actually got involved in the Resilience Fund, because you set it up, right? But you were, you, you used to be a journalist. How did you make that transition? You know, what what was it? Was there any particular incident or, or something that made you switch and shift and, and get involved in this? It's quite a story, but I always wanted to be a journalist. Like, it's something that I always liked. And when I speak to journalists in Mexico and, you know, how a lot of us who wanted to be journalists and end up being journalists end up in the crime beat. And yeah, it's not a thing that you choose, but sort of chooses you. But I always wanted to be a journalist, but I was always fascinated by the stories. And I can tell you since I am 10 years old, this issue, like even in, in the work that I was doing, because I was in a children's journalism workshop, but even the work that we were doing there had to do with narco culture. In, you know, I remember we did a forum for kids to just talk about how we perceive narco culture in our state. So it's always been in the narrative in Sinaloa. You can go away from it, but it's part of, of this duality of life that is also very vibrant and interesting and, and, and rich. And it's also also very dark and violent and 
and associated to uh, apologies of crime. So, but after that, I, I went to Mexico City. I, I covered a lot of topics. Of course, I covered organized crime. It, there was a, the kidnapping crisis in Mexico, covered elections, different things. And then in 2008, I stopped being a journalist and went to work at the International Narcotics Control Board. And it was a hard decision because I loved being a journalist, but I also always was interested on the multilateral world, on the international international relations. So, you know, I, it was a, a great opportunity for me. So I started working in, um, in precursor control, actually. That was a great uh, learning experience about drugs. After that, in the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, I work on human trafficking, but I've also been, although my work became more related to organized crime, I've always, I always stayed on the side of the stories about organized crime. And I think that's how my, my going back to resilience started when I left the UN. And at the time that I left the UN, the GI was starting, lucky me. Yeah. So I was back living in Mexico, the GI, the GI was starting and I was like, okay, now we're looking at organized crime in general. Let me look at resilience while I'm here. And that was a great opportunity because I always felt, you know, being from Sinaloa and then living in Mexico City and then working in, in Vienna in the, you know, in the capital of international organized crime policy. I often felt that whatever was being discussed at the global forums had nothing to do with the lives of, of people living criminal governance, that had nothing to do with the life of people experiencing Violence, and I always felt like you know maybe we were not asking the right people about those stories. Maybe we were not doing enough to bring those voices to the global policy discussions. So when we started looking at resilience, it was a personal interest to tell another story and to you know, but but not just for me and for us in Sinaloa, but also I was like I'm pretty sure in Colombia they feel the same, and you know yes, it, it was the same, right? When when we moved from the resilience pilot project was replicated in, in Colombia or, or in Guatemala, we are like, oh, yeah. So, you know, we are all eager in these local communities to tell a different story. We're all doing already work that deserves recognition and support. So that was uh, the, the initial curiosity, I would say, that got me into resilience. But also, I, I, I do believe that, you know, my journalism background gave me these tools to, to really be able to to reflect this that is a story that is a story that that needs to be told and to be considered in the solutions as well so just now you mentioned that the fund is in Colombia and Guatemala as well and you found commonalities right with with what's happening in other countries as well how many countries does the, the resilience fund now operate in the fund has supported today 150 grantees and 190 projects in 48 countries so we cover a wide range of topics and different types of grassroots organizations. Like I said, sometimes we support individuals, but most of the time we're looking at local grassroots movements, groups, organizations, basically the people who wouldn't really be considered or who wouldn't really have access to other types of grants that are already available for civil society at the international level. The impacts of Resilience Fund have been huge some recipients have gone on to affect changes in policies and laws, including in Mexico. This is Marlene Leon, the director of Iniciativa Sinaloa, a civil society group who managed to develop, campaign for, and finally get an approval on a law for the protection of human rights defenders and journalists in Sinaloa. Our experience and the relationship we had with the Resilience Fund was specifically in a project to promote the development and approval of the Law of Protection of Human Rights Defenders and Journalists in Sonaloa. This due to the increase in attacks and threats received by these two vulnerable groups. And in this sense, what we sought from Iniciativa Sinaloa and with the Resilience Fund was precisely to listen to and involve this group of affected people this vulnerable group of journalists and human rights activists and defenders, with the intention of listening to them and that all the requests were included in a proposal for a new reform and a legislation that would regulate this whole issue of aggressions so that they would feel protected. So thanks to the Resilience Fund, it was possible to listen to them and translate all their concerns into legislation. On May 24, 2002, we achieved the approval of this law, of this legislation, 
It was a very long process that we had the support of the Resilience Fund throughout this action along the way. And for us, it was very valuable that the Resilience Fund trusted civil society to implement this action. So our work here in Sinaloa is just that, to seek to change practices or change regulatory frameworks and promote them in situations that violate freedom of expression, the issue of transparency as well, or when we detect corrupt practices. The challenges we currently face in Sinaloa are many, but mainly this is aggravated by the issue of organized crime, right? And well, our impact is precisely that of a vigilant organization that seeks to reduce these practices and promote the protection of journalists and human rights defenders. Well, our expectations for the future are that now that we have a law for the protection of journalists and human rights defenders, we seek that this law be applied, that it be implemented by the authorities and that it be strengthened hand in hand with this group of people. What are some of the biggest successes and challenges that the fund has had so far? The challenge always remains security. Sadly, every year, two, three people, and that's, that's probably, we don't know, sometimes can be more, but they actually get attacked. And that's something really difficult to deal with. And, uh, you know, like violently like shot, uh, kidnapped, and that's the main thing to deal with. Because with supporting people in this kind of work, it gives us also a lot of responsibility, a lot of responsibility to make sure that this does not create more harm, that we do not increase the grantees' risk levels. So we do work with, a, with an organization that specializes in these issues. We are constantly monitoring security, but it is undeniable that their levels of risk of these activists are incredibly high, right? Like we're talking about organized crime. So this is a very serious issue that we're constantly dealing with. And like I said, you know, the attacks can be from like shootings, kidnappings, but it can also be a lawsuit that forces us to, you know, remove somebody from their country of origin. You know, threats can be like a smear campaign, like I said, on social media that it will uh, force us to speak to somebody or issue statements or letters, but sometimes it's legal support, sometimes it's psychological support. So that's that's the, the level of, of danger uh, around these projects is what really, really gets us because it is it is a very challenging situation. But again, I mean, the, the success stories, I think that's why all of us at the Resilience Fund team can balance that level of of pressure and heat because what we see the results are are simply amazing and you know and every day i think we can see something uh for example yesterday rich asial a fellow from 2022 on environmental grant just won a prestigious award so just the fact that a journalist had one year to do this amazing investigation to get the recognition and and do it in a way that was safe and you know she could grow her work it's it's great for us but we also have great projects that have resulted in from the resilience fund and, and being taken forward i give you the example of, of griselda triana who was one of our first grantees now let's jump out of the interview with syria for a few minutes to hear from griselda triana the wife of the murdered mexican journalist javier valdez and about her work with the resilience fund Como becaria del Fondo de Resiliencia, as a Resilience Fund grantee, I had the opportunity to prepare a study on the situations of the families of murdered and or disappeared journalists in Mexico, in which we detected the effects that they suffered as a consequence of the victimizing event aggravated by the lack of justice. This diagnosis has made possible the creation of the network Tejido Solidarios, made up of families from different states of Mexico. Now, the challenge is for the Mexican state to restore the confidence of the victims of crimes against freedom of expression by clarifying these types of crimes and guaranteeing non-repetition. The creation of the network would not have been possible without the support of the Resilience Fund, which will allow us to legally constitute ourselves as a civil association to continue promoting the encounters of relatives of murdered and missing journalists in Mexico, and of course, to provide support to the families. Y desde luego, brindar acompañamiento a las más familias. Her work with the families of murdered and disappeared journalists 
has been constantly growing to not, and, and she went from being a victim herself to now being a public advocate in for families of murder journalists. And she's now conforming an official network that will represent these families that has not only the authority and the credit to to go and, and take their, their issues to authorities, to other international organizations, but it also has the capacity to be supported, has the, the capacity to be a sustainable project, has the resources to, to be something that is really going to add to the word of these victims. Have there been occasions in Mexico where the Resilience Fund has sort of stepped in, uh, where the state has failed to help or do anything? Yes, and I I don't think this is the only case in Sinaloa, like in Mexico, and in many in many examples where the Resilience Fund is active, and and like I said, it doesn't really have to do with this big national narrative of the failed state. I mean, sometimes we're working in like local rural communities where state presence is really minimal, or local rural communities where you know the de facto government is a criminal group. Thinking that we have stepped out where the government hasn't, well, I think in some occasions, and again, I would think that not only the Resilience Fund, but a lot of civil society organizations, international organizations stepping up with the issue of disappearances, for example. The fact, and and it's not just us, like it was the civil society who stepped up and did the job that the government was not doing it, and we just came to support so yeah, I think this has been this has been the case in Sinaloa, in Mexico, and in many places where the Resilience Fund works. Uh, our grantees are picking up the slack. I think what is also important to say is that you know we don't say in the Resilience Fund like oh this is the answer like you know there's no authority and you know then we have to support civil society to do it themselves. This is not resilience. One thing that we try in the Resilience Fund is also to build those bridges with governments, with private sector, with academia, because it will also be dangerous to tell civil society, here, go alone. That is not sustainable. We believe that we have to work with authorities. We believe that we have to work with governments and with all of civil society because the problem is that big. This is where we leave it for this episode of The Index from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. A big thank you to Syria for joining us today and our Resilience Fund grantees, Rizelda, Malin, and Vanya. In the podcast notes, you'll find a link to the Resilience Fund's activities as well as to the Global Organized Crime Index, which lists 193 countries around the world, scores their levels of criminality and resilience. Remember that this is a free resource and can be accessed by anyone. Just head over to ocindex.net. We'll be back in a few weeks with another episode. I'm Dylan Thanks for listening. <laughs>